a little girl who's just turned 14 years old has been found. Where has she been? With a registered sex predator thousands of miles away from home. That's right. A registered sex offender who was trading child porn online engineered a kidnap of a 14-year-old Washington State girl and held her for weeks. Joining us, her mother, detailing her desperate search for Ella. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. Thousands of miles away from home with a registered sex offender, a little girl who's just turned 14, with a guy that peddles child porn online. It's every parent's worst nightmare. But this time, this time, unlike so many other stranger-on-stranger child abductions, Ella lived. Joining me right now is Ella's mother, Sarah Merrill. Miss Merrill, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Miss Merrill, first of all, praise the Lord. Ella is alive. I've investigated, prosecuted, and covered so many cases that had a very different outcome in the end. And I think it's a miracle. I really do. I remember when you were on with us earlier during the search for Ella, the heartbreak in your voice, what you were living through trying to find her. Could you tell us how you found out that Ella had been found alive? I received a call from the detectives here in Washington that the um, Michigan had obtained her and she was safe. What were you doing and when you got the call? We were still searching for her um, and trying to stay as busy as possible while waiting to hear if um, they were going to find her. Do you remember that moment? What went through your mind and your body when you learned your daughter had been found? It was almost, it was just shock, disbelief, re relief. There were so many feelings all at once. I immediately was crying. Uh, her little brother started jumping up and down and running across the house yelling yes. And we were, we were both just had tears in our eyes. And I just, I couldn't believe it. After so much time had gone by, I was really nervous that when I got that call that it wouldn't have an outcome as good as that one. Um, so the relief to hear it was more than a recovery of just a body and it was her safe was just the best case scenario after all of that time. After weeks had passed and no word, no text, no call, no email, no message, nothing from Ella, had anyone started trying to prepare your mind for the worst? I wasn't quite there yet. Um, I, I, I still believe deep down that she was alive, that I could feel her. But as more and more time passed, you have to, you start to worry. When you say that deep down inside you could feel her, what do you mean by that? When I'd start to get really nervous that we weren't going to have the outcome that we were able to have, I would close my eyes and try to feel her and I felt like she was there. She felt far away, but she felt there. How did that odyssey unfold from the moment you realized she was missing and the frantic, uh, you went out physically looking for her and then night after night after night passes and no word. Let's start at the beginning. When did you realize Ella was gone? It was Saturday the 6th. I woke up and I was enjoying a quiet morning and realized I hadn't heard a peep from her. And at about 11, 11.30, decided I'd go check on her and she was gone. You went in her room and 
nothing. Did she leave anything behind? Um, no, I mean, you could tell she had taken stuff. I, I hadn't quite processed everything that she had taken with her at that point. I just frantically started going across the entire house and making sure I wasn't just overreacting. Um, at the point where I knew she wasn't in the house, I immediately called the police. Yeah, and when I go to my daughter's room and she's not in there, um, first I look in her closet where her clothes are, then I look in her bathroom, then I read, I go to the brother's, her brother's room, John David, then I go uh, up to the kitchen, I go back and forth, and when I can't find her, I go outside. I'm just imagining what was going through your mind when this happened. But then, unlike a lot of people, you physically go out and start looking after you call police, and you went to some of her friend's house. What did you learn at the friend's house? It was immediately the first friend's house I stopped at where I heard concerns that she may be with someone they had known she'd been talking to online. Um, we, That friend then started helping me call other friends and her parents were very active and like willing to help me go other places and talk to other teens and parents and find her um at the beginning there was a bunch of kids that said slight different variations of the same story it was and then as time more and more time went by the game of telephone with the teenagers grew so it got more and more confusing and it was really hard to separate what was actually going on versus what, what the kids had i mean there was one kid who said that she had heard he'd come from a different state. There were three different kids who thought that. And all three different kids who thought that the man who had her came from a different state referenced different states, um, none of which were Michigan. Um, so there definitely was some confusion on the kids' parts. But they were all, when I sat down and thought about it, they all had one thing in common. They all had a man from online. They all thought his name was Keith, and they all thought he came from a different state. Now, some of them had actually seen him during one of his calls to Ella, I think, or they saw a picture of him and described him as having facial hair, uh, brown hair, a white male. Correct. That's not a lot to go on. Um, a white male with brown it, hair, facial hair from another state named Keith. It is not a lot to go on. It was uh, really frustrating. We were grabbing at straws, um, and any straw I could grab, I was trying to piece it together. Obviously, um, a lot of it didn't make sense. I had kind of dismissed it not making sense because I just kept going back to the point where there was a man online, he's from a different state, and, you know, a vague description of him. We did, as the time went on, the initial description came from one of her teen friends who had seen her on a video with him, and she wasn't sure which platform the video was on or anything like that, and she gave the brief description. As time went on, uh, another child had come forward and had a very similar description. Um, those two children have never interacted or know each other. One is a family friend that lives in a different town, so Ella had access to the computer and um, our very loving and nosy 10-year-old that we love very much had caught Ella on that video chat and gave the very similar description as the teenager. Um, it was at that time that it was like, well, this this is more than coincidence. We have two children who've never met and who've never had a conversation who are giving very similar details. So you've got a general description. You've got out of state but still, it's almost like a needle in a haystack. Could you tell me everything you did to try and find Ella, your girl? She's 14. So the first Saturday was spent, me and Kim, Ella's godmother, spent out going to all the grocery stores, trying to talk to all the employees, getting a flyer, a crude flyer that we had made while driving around on our phones, printed and getting it to staff employees of 
the main grocery stores. It was relatively cold that. at that point. Tell me about going into grocery stores and asking to put up the flyer of your daughter. Large businesses don't like to put up flyers, so I was targeting staff rooms. Um, my idea with that was it was fairly cold um, that weekend. It was like our cold snap for winter, so it was like 20 degrees, and I we didn't have you know, a absolute confirmation of what had really happened. So I was thinking maybe she'd go into a store to warm up. Um, and so I was targeting them getting it up and their staff employees so that we had surveillance at those warm locations while they were open. So why do you say uh, big, uh, big companies don't want to put up missing flyers? They have protocols. Uh, it, for example, like Walmart will only put up the missing ones through NEMIC, and they have to be missing over three months. A lot of places don't have bulletin boards anymore. And if they do have bulletin boards, not a lot of people look at bulletin, bulletin boards. They don't want them, the flyers up on their main doors and stuff like that. Um, so I was targeting staff employees. Wow. Okay. And trying to get in, in staff rooms. What would these people say to you when you would come in and go, my daughter's disappeared, can you help me? Most people were very willing to help um, and very concerned. Wow. I it, just, it, I never actually I would say 99%. Thought... Some people feel, don't seem to have as much of a reaction, but I'd say 99% are very responsive to it. Um, so you go out, you make flyers, first. you go out posting them, trying to put them up. You meet with some resistance. You meet with some people that will put the flyers up. At the end of the day, when you would get home, tell me about what would happen when you get home and you shut the door and you sit down. I was scouring electronics. I had every single electronic in the household out at my kitchen table, and I was going through browsers to find any grape of undeleted history for clues. So the Sunday after going around and getting talking to employees, I then spent about 10 hours with two of my close friends hacking every account we can get into. Um, we were able to finally get into three of Ella's social media accounts all of which were accounts she was not supposed to have had at that point. What were they? I uh, I was able to get into her Facebook, her Snapchat, and her TikTok. What did you She learn? had deleted. Uh, what did she delete? She had deleted email addresses that she had previously used, and I was not able to get into the current active email address that we were able to piece together from different browsers. Um, we then started going through every single user on her Snapchat. That was definitely the most active account. The Facebook she primarily used to talk to family. She didn't really use it. Which account was she not so, supposed to have? She was not supposed to have Snapchat or TikTok. Uh, I'd had to talk with her about earning back those accounts and having like shared accounts and that and where I could have access and I basically explained I didn't want to sit there and invade her privacy or anything like that but as far as safety it, it needed to be accounts I was aware of and periodically could monitor and that would be our agreement for moving forward unfortunately we were not um we haven't gotten to that point yet uh so these accounts she had made on her school computer because and the little, parental controls on her phone were too rigid for the most part for her to do a lot on it. So some of the access she was getting from the school computer. Correct. You know, everyone online, everybody that you talk to and I talk to, they have so much sage advice, don't they? You should do this. You shouldn't do that. But you were doing it all. This is a teen girl, 14 years old. She's going to find a way to get on TikTok. It's happening. And I believe that parents that don't want to accept it is happening have their head in their sand and the butt in the air. That's what I think. It's happening, but we've got to find a way to deal with it correctly. Correct. And that's why I was trying to... 
you don't want to isolate them socially no. as well. So I wanted to make sure she had a phone, but I wanted for communication purposes and safety, but not also have all of that unmonitored, you know, con- access to the whole entire world in her hand and have it limited so that it was in a safe, safer context. So she but actually met this guy on Discord. I believe it's uh, no, a it was, website um, that is no longer. Yes, yes. It's, they met on yeah. um, a different site that was closed down, right, Amigle? Correct. And, and Amigle my... just throws you into a chat room. Uh, Correct. That you have no idea who you're speaking with. So she was put in a chat room with a guy who is a registered sex offender. Correct. Once Amigle shut scary. down, then they moved to Discord. Snapchat. Snapchat, got it. And all of this is happening while you think your girl is safe at home with you. But the world, as you just right. said, the world is in her hand. How did you get through the three weeks that she was gone? I'm not sure how, to be honest. Uh it took quite a while for me to be able to sleep at all. I was obsessively looking online. When I couldn't be out looking for her physically, I was obsessively looking online. We started to get a lot of sightings. Now we know none of them were actual real sightings. So when we had sightings, especially if you had multiple sightings in a similar area, I would spend my time canvassing and talking to people in those areas. And when I didn't have a lead that seemed likely, I was scouring computers and the internet. So you would physically go to wherever you thought there was a credible lead and question people? Yes. When you first saw Ella, what happened? We hugged. And we hugged for a really long time, and there was definitely tears. It was unbelievable. I jumped on a plane as fast as I could to get to her. I was fortunate enough to have another really good family friend who was only an 11-hour drive away. She jumped in the car as soon as we got the call that they had found Ella. She beat me there. So she was laying in the bed with Ella waiting for me in the hospital to get there, Um, which I'm very thankful for. The detectives in Michigan were absolutely amazing. I was very worried about someone finding Ella and me not being there immediately for support. The detectives there were amazing. And after meeting them, I just had so much relief that those were the people that were there with her from the moment they found her until I got there. You are hearing Sarah Merrill, who I now consider to be a friend. She is the mother of 14-year-old Ella. Beautiful girl, sweet, loving, good grades, the works. Sarah doing everything right, everything authorities tell us to do to keep our children safe. Yet somehow, this guy, a registered sex offender, gets through to her girl. Miss Merrill, what is your message today? Talk with your kids, communicate with your kids, watch your kids, do the best you can. I think there should be more resources to helping us monitor our children as far as education for parents. Some parents are better at technology than others and it's overwhelming and we shouldn't all be alone trying to navigate it and when i think about the owners and the ceos and the cfos of all the social media community sitting back in their mansions and their yachts and their fleet of cars they have no idea what havoc they are wreaking in our lives. It's 
it is alarming what Section 230 is allowed for protection of liability on these companies and the lack of accountability that it has created for it. It is something I wasn't fully aware of and didn't really pay attention prior to this. And now that I'm looking at it, it's horrifying. For today, for right now, even though there are many more battles to be fought, investigation, uh, forensics, gathering evidence, uh, court dates, uh, shrinks, psychologists, social workers, all that is ahead. But for now, I'm just in the moment of knowing Ella is home. Ms. Merrill, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me again. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.